my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is February 5th through the 11th of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're studying the Book of Mormon this year for 2024. And if you didn't notice, I am in a different location than I normally am. I have the very fortunate opportunity to be collaborating with FAIR LDS and they are allowing me to use their studio. So I'm really, really excited about that. Anyway, not a lot is going to be changing about how I try to do my YouTube channel and blog posts and podcast. And so it'll pretty much follow the same pattern that I have always done. Now for this week, for February 5th through 11th, we find Lehi and he is dying and he is talking to his posterity. So he is blessing them. He is giving advice, he's prophesying, and he is also teaching doctrine. Now, one of the specific doctrines that he teaches to his children really hit me this time. It's Second Nephi. It is chapter 2, and it's verse 27. It says, Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. So this phrase, this phrase that I want to talk about, it's they're free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men. Now, I feel like with my posts, I have tried really hard to talk about that relationship between grace and works. And as I was reading this verse this time, I realized that Lehi illuminated my understanding about that relationship even more. And he did it in one sentence. They are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men. This is such a fantastic way (laughs) to teach grace and works. So I want you to imagine for a second that choosing liberty and eternal life, choosing salvation, choosing to live with our Heavenly Father again, I want you to imagine that it's literally just a multiple choice test. And on this multiple choice test, there is one question. And the question is, what do you want? Option A, liberty and eternal life, or option B, captivity and death, right? Two choices, very, very easy, right? Now, that's kind of, it's kind of silly, but I'm trying to highlight a very specific principle here. And that is that without Christ, that question would read, what do you want? And there would only be one choice and it would be captivity and death, right? That's why, that's why we believe that grace was a gift freely given. It's not something that we paid for. We didn't pay for eternal life, right? Christ, through his sacrifice, made that option available to us. No matter how many right choices we made, no matter how much we changed to become like our Heavenly Father, no matter how many times we were able to catch glimpses of what eternity was supposed to be like when we're with friends or family, none of that would have mattered without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ paying so that option could appear at all. That is why... The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes that salvation is a gift. It was freely given. We believe in the grace of Jesus Christ. However, we also believe that a choice still had to be made. Now, I was recently watching Prince of Egypt with my kids. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I feel the spirit every single time. The music is magnificent. It is an incredible movie. But as I was pondering this week about this principle, this idea of grace and works, this movie hit me a little bit differently. So I want you to imagine the Israelites, they are, they get to the edge of the Red Sea and they're at the edge of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden they look behind them and Pharaoh and his armies are coming and they are facing captivity or death, right? Moses as a type of Christ steps into the water and he parts the sea. And all of a sudden that option of liberty was made available, 
right? It wasn't there before. It was given through the power of Jesus Christ. The option to be free was provided, was given as a gift to the Israelites. They were able to find freedom away from captivity and death with the Egyptians. Now, I want you to imagine the silliness <laughs> of the Israelites if they had chosen to, if they're just ecstatic, right? They see the water part and they're like, yes, like liberty and eternal life, right? But then they chose to just camp on the shore and they didn't choose to actually walk through the freedom that had been provided for them. And I think this is actually really significant, right? When Heavenly Father enabled this story, when he set this story up and set the details running, he didn't take the Israelites and he didn't transport them to the other side of the Red Sea, right? He parted the sea. He gave them the option. He gave them liberty. He gave them the option of liberty so that they could choose to walk and grow and learn to appreciate him as they're walking through the middle of the Red Sea, right? That journey. Can you imagine how significant it was as they took that option, right? It's amazing. Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ will not force us to walk forward. Honestly, it would destroy the plan of salvation, right? We wouldn't be able to grow. They will not force eternal life upon us. They will not force us to live in a way where we can experience peace and happiness in the way that they do. There are some who might argue that belief in Jesus Christ is all that's required. But I'm of the opinion that eternal life is something that we grow into. It's not something that is just bestowed and it just descends upon us. There are aspects of that, like all the glory and everything that they talk about. That stuff descends upon us. It's a blessing. But as for actually... I guess what I'm trying to say is eternal life as we develop, as we take that option that Jesus Christ gave us, as we choose to walk through the Red Sea, we develop that appreciation, we develop that strength as we are walking and growing towards our Heavenly Father. And it is in that journey and it is in that growth that we grow into eternal life, what it was meant to be. We also believe that that option, that liberty and eternal life was a gift that was given to us. That's why we believe in grace. Now, when I first started speaking about this, I talked about how, like, let's pretend that choosing liberty and eternal life, let's say that it was just that simple multiple choice test, right? And I did that because I wanted to highlight the fact that Christ unlocked that, that it was a gift, that it's not something that we paid for. Christ paid for it. But obviously, <laughs> actually making that choice is not as simple as just circling it on the test. Actually choosing liberty and eternal life is a little bit more involved than that. Now, part of choosing liberty and eternal life, it is choosing to develop those qualities that Heavenly Father would have us develop qualities that will make us like Him so we can experience the life that He experiences. So traits like humility, traits like charity, these aren't just arbitrary traits that He told, commanded us to be so that we would be good at worshiping Him, right? He gave us those commandments to develop those kinds of traits because He knows that those traits will help us find happiness in the way that he finds happiness. However, that is not the only way that we experience eternal life. There are other aspects to eternal life. And let me explain what I'm trying to say. So part of choosing to walk through that Red Sea, yes, it requires doing our best to make those right choices and doing our best to be kind, become the kinds of people who are like our Heavenly Father. But there's another aspect to eternal life that can also start here in our lives in mortal life. And that is the fact that part of eternal life is living with our Heavenly Father and the Savior again. It's not just about becoming like them. It's also about being with them. And because we have a veil over our eyes, because we don't remember them, we may not fully grasp how significant that is. 
we may not be able to understand why that is such a huge part of eternal life, to be reunited with them and to be around them again. (laughs) But if we were to remember, if we were to even catch a glimpse of the relationship that we had with them, if we were to taste even a small piece of the love that they have for us, we would understand why that is such a significant part of experiencing eternal life. Choosing eternal life, choosing to develop the qualities that will make us happy like our Heavenly Father can start happening today but also choosing to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those are things that also should start happening today so that we can start experiencing eternal life today. So how do we do that? How do we start to experience that relationship with them today, right? Especially when we don't remember them. Well, interestingly enough, it is found in that same verse that we've been talking about this entire time. It's through the great mediator of all men. Christ paid for us to experience eternal life in the sense that all of our sins will be washed away, in the sense that our right choices will matter, but also in the sense that he made it possible for us to be reconciled with our heavenly father again, to be able to experience his presence at whatever degree we are able to do so. He has provided the opportunity, but we still have to do the walking. We still have to walk through that Red Sea. Now, there are many things that can prevent us from having that relationship with them. So obviously, we have rebelliousness and laziness and all of those things that can prevent that relationship with them. But there are also much more subtle tactics of Satan that we need to recognize if we want to have that relationship with with our Heavenly Father. So for example, holding on to guilt too long, Uh, perfectionism, unworthy. And it's funny because sometimes I think we almost feel like it's righteous. It's oddly righteous to believe that we can't approach our Heavenly Father because we're not worthy, right? But that could not be farther from what our Heavenly Father wants. Obviously, we are unworthy to approach Him. It's only through the Savior's atonement that we can approach Him. However, nothing is farther from our Heavenly Father's desires. He loves us and He wants to have that relationship with us again. And Satan would do anything to keep us from believing that Heavenly Father wants that relationship with us. Satan would do anything to keep us from that belief Because Satan, even if we don't, Satan understands the power of that belief. He knows what happens when we know that our Heavenly Father loves us and wants to be around us. He knows what happens when we, as we learn that they love us, we start to experience peace and happiness, even in the midst of when we're making mistakes, in the midst of any circumstances we're facing, we start to feel that peace and happiness that we were always supposed to be feeling associated with the gospel. And with that peace and happiness, we find the motivation we need to keep walking through the Red Sea, right? Satan knows that if we find that relationship with our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the commandments cease to be a burden and they become what they were meant to be, which is freedom and peace, right? We will begin to crave that, to crave becoming like our Heavenly Father. So Christ paid for us to have the opportunity to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, but we cannot camp on the side of the Red Sea. If we try to, we will constantly be plagued by fears of captivity and death. Not only do we have to walk forward in the sense that we have to keep the commandments and do our best to make right choices, but we have to walk forward and choose to trust in our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. We have to choose to believe that they love us. We have to recognize Satan and his tactics 
and choose to mentally shun him when Satan is trying to keep us from developing that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And it's interesting because this trust in our Heavenly Father and our Savior, it honestly, it's an act of faith. Maybe we don't see how they love us yet. Maybe we can't yet feel their love. But if we choose to act in faith, if we choose to consciously choose our thought patterns and our beliefs, if we get ourselves into different situations that are difficult and we say, no, I'm going to choose to believe that Heavenly Father loves me. If we do that over and over and over and over again, if we take those tiny steps of faith, eventually it's going to come to the point where it's not faith anymore. It's knowledge where we can feel that love very consistently. I want to testify of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that He paid the ultimate price so that the option of liberty and eternal life could come to us, not only in the form of us becoming like them, but also being with them again. I know that they want to have a relationship with us. I know that Satan wants to keep us from having a relationship with them. I know that because I know what it's like to have a relationship with them. And I know what it's like to not have a relationship with them. And I know how my life has changed as I've developed that relationship. And it's very easy to see why Satan would try to prevent that because it makes all the difference. It helps me experience all the peace and happiness associated with salvation. It helps me experience it on a daily basis as I work towards actually getting to that point where I'm reunited with them. I'm grateful for my savior and how he paid that ultimate price so that I could. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.